Hello, everyone. First of all, I just want to thank you for calling in today for the TNA Impact Wrestling Slammiversary Pay-Per-View Press Call with World Champ Bully Ray. Just a little housekeeping. I do have an MP3 available after the call in pictures, so just let your PR representative know, either myself, Rowan, or Simon. So tomorrow night's Impact is broadcast from Tampa, Florida, with a new start time of 9, 8 central. We, uh, it's a final countdown to Slammiversary with a huge main event match that will start with the Icon Sting teaming up with Joseph Park to battle World Heavyweight Champion Bully Ray and Devon of the Aces and Eights. AJ Styles is back in action against Mr. Anderson. There's a mixed tag team action with Chris Sabin and Taryn Terrell taking on X Division Champion Kenny King and Gail Kim. And a huge eight-man tag team match will occur as well with Chavo, Hernandez, James Storm, and Gunner taking on Bobby Roode, Austin Aries, Daniels, and Kazarian. Now, uh, this Sunday live on pay-per-view from Boston is Slammiversary, and we have the Gut Check Tournament Final with Jay Bradley and versus Sam Shaw, the Knockouts Match with Gail Kim versus Taryn Terrell, the Ultimate X Match with Kenny King versus Suicide versus Chris Sabin, the TV Title Match with Devon versus Joseph Park, the four-team Elimination TNA Tag Team Title Match, Chavo Guerrero and Hernandez versus Christopher Daniels and Kazarian versus Austin Aries and Bobby Roode versus James Storm and Gunner. We have Kurt Angle versus AJ Styles as well. And the World Heavyweight Championship, Sting, will be battling against our current champ, Bully Ray. We're open for questions now. To ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Your first question comes from the line of Mike Johnson. Hello, Bully. How are you, sir? How you doing, Mike? I'm doing good. Obviously, the last year of your career has been a pretty stellar one, a uh, different role for you, and obviously a top role as a singles performer. Um, how, how does being in that top position change the way that you – prepare for your matches mentally and even physically because you've been on top before in, in different companies and in different scenarios, but being the guy at the top of the pyramid, how does that change the pressure of uh, going into a main event like Slammiversary on Sunday? Um, I channel, I channel all the pressure into the performance and um, because I have been, um, you, you know, in the tag team world, I've been in extremely high-profile matches all over the world. So being in a high-profile singles match, um, I kind of understand the pressure, and, I, and I'm able to channel, you know, the pressure, you know, into the performance. The only difference is, you know, now it's all on me. It's all on my shoulders uh, from a total performance point of view. If, um, you know, in a, in a tag team match, if something's going wrong, if, if you need a break, a breather, you can always look to your partner and tag out. Um, can't do that. Um, I'm up against, obviously, one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time in Sting. This is probably the biggest match of my singles career. Um, and I'd say one of the biggest matches of my career to this point. Looking forward to it a lot. Um, proud of the fact that I am main eventing TNA's second largest pay per view of the year, probably. All right. Thank you, sir. Your next question comes from the line of Mike Minow with CBS Radio. Hi, actually, that's Leno. Hey, uh, Bully. Uh, we're really proud of you, obviously, for those of us who followed your entire career before ECW, what you and Diva accomplished in Japan. And uh, Mike asked some of my questions. So we're enjoying your current arc as the center of attention, world champion and boss of Aces and Eights. So here's the question. Um, is currently right in TNA, is this the most satisfying for you professionally? And do you feel the success and interest uh, globally in Aces and Eights has sort of forced WWE to try yet another invading group in their copycat shield? I'm not uh, – well, I'll take the last part first. Uh, I'm not – quite sure that the shield is a copycat of the aces and eights. Um, 
uh, you know, they, they have their product, we have ours, and I'm proud of our product because when I sit back and I look, look at the landscape of, of professional wrestling, I can honestly say that I believe TNA offers the best brand of sports entertainment slash pro wrestling. Um, there is a little bit of everything for everybody in this promotion. Um, so as far as them, yeah, I, I really don't even worry about what they're doing. I believe they offer a different brand of entertainment as opposed to ours, which is a little edgier. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, you know, uh, ECW, um, you know, may, may, maybe not as edgy, but, you know, definitely uh, dipping towards that, you know, that way. Um, I'm really proud of everything that, you know, we've been able to accomplish with the Aces and Eights. Um, proud of the fact of where I've come and how I've been able to do it. And I did it the old fashioned way. Um, I went out there and I made everybody open their eyes just the way I've been making everybody open their eyes for the past 20 years. Whether you loved me in Devon, whether you hated me in Devon, you always had to respect the fact that we went out there and we always made sure we found the spotlight and we commanded the spotlight. And that's exactly what I'm doing now out, you know, on my own as the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. And certainly TNA is way more wrestling-centric, so uh, just really can't wait to see the pay-per-view. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Your next question comes from the line of Ryan Ryder. Bully Ray, world champion. Was that something that you ever expected to hear earlier in your career? Well, I, I heard it pretty early on in my career. It was just world tag team champion. Yeah. But transitioning from tag team to, to being a singles competitor, was that always your goal? No. Actually, um, I, I've said this in other interviews when I first got into wrestling, as, as a matter of fact, as far back as I can remember being a wrestling fan back in the late 70s when I was watching the Strongbows versus, um, you know, Fuji and Saida and Gorilla and Martel, I was a tag team wrestling fan first. That's my earliest memories of pro wrestling. And I uh, always loved tag team wrestling. I always thought that a wrestling match could be so much more exciting with four guys as opposed to two. So as uh, you know, as I you know, before I got into the business, uh, I knew that I wanted to be part of a tag team. I wanted to have a a successful, legendary tag team that people were going to talk about, you know, forever. And the likes of the Road Warriors and the Rock and Roll Express and the Midnight Express and Arn and Tully and all of the Freebirds and the Funks, all of those other legendary tag teams. And that was my goal. And I believe that me and Devon accomplished that goal. I will never, ever say that me and Devon are the greatest tag team that ever lived or we're the best tag team that ever lived because I really don't know what dictates greatest or best. However, what I can tell you is this. We are the most successful tag team that's ever lived. And when you sit back and when you analyze tag team wrestling history and when you talk about the best or greatest of all time, you're going to have to mention me and Devon. The Dudley Boys slash Team 3D have done what no other tag team has been able to accomplish. So now, after, you know, now after we look back and we, you know, we look at the landscape of things in in, uh, about three years ago when we see that there's really no other tag teams for us to, you know, feud with or have a run with or, you know, really make money with or, you know, sit back and go, well, what do you do now? Well, that was the right time for us to go our separate ways. That was the right time to embark on singles careers and say, all right, we conquered the world of tag team wrestling. Let's see what we can do with our singles careers. And everything is going really well for the both of us. He's the TV champion. As you know, I'm the world heavyweight champion, the Aces and Eights. We are on the tip of everybody's tongue in the wrestling world. Your next question comes from the line of Scott Fishman. Hey, Bully. Uh, Scott Fishman, Miami Herald. Um, question I had is just on your overall uh, evolution and the transition you made in the singles ranks, um, what do you attribute that to in, in growing, and did you ever think uh, that you'd be as successful as the TNA World Champion as you, you become? Was that the ultimate goal when you first uh, transitioned to the singles ranks? 
No, when I when I first uh, transitioned into a singles wrestler, I my goal was to see how close I could get to the original version of me without actually being able to do what I did, you know, in ECW. That that very edgy character, that inner face um, guy who. I knew could be the most hated guy around, and is. I'll put, I'll put Bully Ray up against anybody when it comes to being the most hated, and n- nobody spits venom like I can on a microphone. That's not me just saying it. That's fact. Um, so, you know, the, the whole evolution has uh, has been very interesting because. I just wanted to see how far I could go when we first split up, and see how many people I could piss off. Was my goal to become the world heavyweight champion? Not necessarily at first, but when I saw how everything was going and I saw how, you know, uh, some of the some of the fans were reacting and really getting into everything, my last man standing match with AJ Styles, any of the other matches that I had with any of the great wrestlers in TNA, people were really getting into it, and it's 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 the character has really grown. And, I, and I've always said this. I, you know, I say the word character, and it's really weird. It's not a character. Right. I just turn the volume up on who I really am. Okay. And, you know, you're, you're able to get such a rise out of people, such a reaction. Um, I was just curious how much, uh, obviously, TNA gives you uh, the freedom on the microphone. Would you, is there any time where you've gone backstage and you're like, wow, I can't believe you said that? Or it's been like, wow, that's, that was great what you did. No, that's the great thing about TNA is the, the the freedom that we do have and the freedom that I enjoy. Um, TNA allows guys to be who they think they should be. And I think that's why we have such great talent and such great characters here. And that's why I think the fans are able to emotionally invest in our characters better than any others out there. Being able to go out there and say the things that I want to say and how I want to say them allows me to be as successful as I am. All right. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Sean Radigan. Hey, Bully. How you doing? Good. Um, what was your inspiration a few years ago to, you know, really dedicate yourself to get into shape? Well, I knew that when me and Devon had gone our separate ways that we would, uh, you know, there would need to be a drastic reinvention and quickly. I knew which direction I wanted to go in, um, you know, quote, unquote, character wise, um, I always knew what I was and what made me successful as a character. I knew my athletic, my in-ring ability, you know, was always there. So now I just had to do something from a visual point of view, and I thought, well, now is the time to get into the physical condition that um, I always truly wanted to be in, and I knew I could be. You know, whether I was a four, whether I was 400 pounds, or whether you know where I am now at 275, I always considered myself a really good athlete. And if you go back and you watch any of the matches, you could see that there was, you know, no one that you know me or me and Devon couldn't hang with. But I knew there needed to be a reinvention. I always kind of compare it to Kiss. You know, Kiss wore the makeup. Then they needed to reinvent themselves, and they took the makeup off. Then they needed to reinvent themselves again, so they put the makeup back on. Um, I think the physical reinvention is what really got people to sit up and take notice, and I think that that's when they realized how dedicated I was to making this whole, you know, single uh, transition work. I feel great out there. I know I look better out there. Um, and I, it, it all clicked at the same time. So that really was my motivation. Just needed an overnight reinvention. Uh I wanted to commend you. I, I, I heard you on the local uh, radio yesterday in Boston doing a show, and uh, the host was you know, pretty disrespectful to you. He was a Jeff Hardy fan. Um, and I thought you handled yourself really well considering some of the things he said to you. Uh, what's it like for you to go out there and be you know, able to represent TNA in a setting like that and, and, and get you know, a 
questions from a host like that that you know I didn't even think existed in this day and age. Well, as far as the, the interview yesterday, you know, it's cool that he's a Jeff Hardy fan. I don't care. You could be a fan of anybody you want in wrestling. That's, you know, that's objective. So if he would have just said, hey, Bully, I don't like you because, you know, I like Jeff Hardy better, well, then that's cool. But don't ever call me average. Don't yeah. ever, you know, don't ever second guess what I've accomplished in this business and tell me that, oh, you know, you were disappointed to have me on the air. You know, if you were that disappointed to have me on the air, why didn't you just tell me when I shook your hand and said hello and we could have saved everybody, you know, the hassle of even doing the interview. But this guy figures he'll throw his digs in on the air and try to get at me, and I just verbally shot him down. And anybody that's on the line knows if this was 10 years ago, the verbal beratement would have been a lot worse. <laughs> but uh, there's only so much you could say in this day and age. So, uh you know, so yeah, listen, that's 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 past me, whatever. But um, I enjoy um, doing interviews like this and and speaking on behalf of TNA and the Aces and Eights because I believe all we can do is help move the company forward. And I see so much light at the end of the tunnel for TNA. And I think things start to click. Sometimes you get a little off track, and then they start to click again. But I think Slammiversary is going to be a great pay-per-view. I know what I'm going to go out there and deliver, and I know what all the other guys in the locker room are going to go out there and deliver. Because when you sit back and you look at this locker room and every single wrestler that makes up this company, it's the best cross-section of pro wrestlers in the whole world anywhere. Well, uh, thank you, Bully, and uh, congratulations on all your success. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Adam Davey. Good evening, Bully. It's uh, Adam here from the V2 Journal in uh, the UK. How are you, mate? <laughs> really good, thanks. First of all, I just like to start. Which, which, which that, football? Uh, which football club do you? Which football club do you root for? Well, I, I'm actually Welsh, so uh, I'm going to have to say uh, Swansea at the moment, uh, who, who are doing well in the... In the Swansea? Uh, okay, what's your question? <laughs> I noticed that you're a big fan of soccer over here. Did, did you get to see a game on the UK tour as a matter of interest before I ask my proper question? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Whenever we, whenever we go to the UK, the first question I ask is, what date we have off and is there a game? But uh, so far... Uh, actually, one time we were over there and me and James Storm got to go catch a... German B League game, and uh, it, it was great because the the, the passion of uh, you know football over there in Europe is just it, it blows away anything in the United States. Well, next time you're over in January, uh, let Simon Rothstein know, and I'll hook you up with some tickets. Sounds great. All right. Anyway, back to my question. First, of all, I wanted to say that um, you know that your character development over the last two three years has been absolutely phenomenal, and uh, seeing you with the belt, it just feels right at the moment. So well done on that. But my question is to do with the UK tour. Uh, when you were over here this year, you were pretty much the top babyface in the company at the time. Uh, it was before you were revealed as the leader. A lot of the programming around that time, you were doing a lot of Hulk Hogan mannerisms, you know, the, uh, the, the getting punch and the no and, and all that kind of stuff. Whose idea was that, and, and how did it feel doing it? Did you enjoy it? It was my idea, and it was a lot of fun to do. And it was fun to do because the people responded to it. Whatever I do in that ring, I don't do for myself. I do for the emotional investment of the fan. Are they going to like this or are they going to hate this? Um, and I learned that lesson from Vince McMahon. I'll never forget the day he pulled me on the side and he told me straight up, he goes, he goes, all of your ideas and everything that you come up with is so, so good. But remember, never, ever go out there and do what you think is entertaining. Go out there and what they think is entertaining. So I, you know, I knew at the time that, you know, hulking up would fit perfectly into everything that we're doing. And, and, and I enjoyed it also. I thought, I thought it was a lot of fun to do. Hell, he, he, made, he, he got 25 great years out of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, on that note, just a quick follow-up. Obviously, you've got your wrestling school. Does the way that you, you teach the students differ when you're a heel or when you're a face uh, on, on TV programming? No. No, no, no. Um, me and Devon's wrestling school, the Team 3D Academy of Professional Wrestling in, uh, in Kissimmee, Florida, um, we are a very old-school 
Pro Wrestling Academy. Um, our slogan is old school rules, new school tools. We teach our students in the old school way of the business, which is based in uh, and has a foundation in respect for the business. You respect the other guys that you're in there with. You respect the business. You respect the veterans that came before you. And then we try to teach them in the new school way what it takes to make it in pro wrestling today. Um, we start them from A to Z. There's so many wrestling schools out there in the United States and all over the world who are run by guys who have absolutely no business training younger wrestlers because they weren't successful, they never made any money, and they never got over in the business. So what business do they have training up-and-coming wrestlers? Um, you know, so th that's really how we look at wrestling at the wrestling at our, at our academy. We try to give them the strongest foundation in the, in the wrestling business we can. And we have the longest school out there. Our school is a one-year school. So, you know, even after a year, you, you still don't know what the hell you're doing, but at least you have a year of quality training under your belt. That's great. Well, thanks for your time tonight, and I uh, hope to see you back in January when you come back to the U.K. Sounds good. Thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Alan Levine. Hi, Billy. Uh, I'm Alan Levine speaking on behalf of the Punchliner Show from Israel. Uh, let me start off by saying it's a true honor to talk to you. And uh, my question is, uh, how does it feel to be the guy of Impact Wrestling? Is it as good as you've always imagined? And do you think it could have been any bigger in uh, WWE? Um, well, uh, being the guy, quote-unquote, the guy, um, of Impact Wrestling is, you know, it's definitely cool. I never really sat back and got, you know, thought about it like, hey, I want to be the guy, the guy. Um, I always knew that if I just busted my ass and did what I did, it would, you know, it, it, it would happen. You know, you can't stand in the way of success. You can't stop rock and roll and you can't stop me. Um, as far as, you know, you know, get back to being the guy, it's great to be the world heavyweight champion. But at the end of the day, this is a wrestling company composed of a lot of different wrestlers. And not only one guy can carry um, a wrestling promotion, in my opinion, in this day and age. It takes everybody. And like I said, I think this is a great locker room and a great cross-section of all of the great wrestlers, uh, of, of great wrestlers. And we give you the best, uh, you know, the best bang for your buck. You know, if pro wrestling was a buffet, yeah. um, Tommy Dreamer's fat. That's a Tommy Dreamer's fat line. I always got a very Dreamer. You guys know that. Um, so, uh, you know, we offer the best buffet in pro wrestling, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, who of the newest guys do you think has the, uh, do you see has the biggest future in TNA and wrestling? Um, as far as new guys are concerned, like real young guys, I think the, I think two guys stand out to me, Magnus and Rockstar Spud. Uh, I think Magnus is, quote-unquote, has the total package. He's got a phenomenal physique. He's young. He has great in-ring ability. He speaks really well. And I think he, you know, he's got world champion written on him in the years to come. Rockstar Spud He's got, he's got it. He's got that it factor. He's got passion. He's, he's got piss and vinegar. He's got fire. He hits that ring like it's the last match he's ever going to have, and uh, you just can't help but, you know, be into him, you know, when you, when you hear him speak or when, or when he hits that ring. All right. Thank you very much, and uh, we hope to see you in Israel anytime soon. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Josh Motherberry. Hi, Billy. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Uh, great pleasure to speak to yourself. Um, you've mentioned Vince McMahon already. Um, how would you um, compare your three bosses, uh, Paul Heyman, Vince McMahon, and Dixie Carter? Um, I the, the people that I have learned, I've learned more about professional rest of professional wrestling business from guys like Paul and Vince because those are pure wrestling 
minds. And those are two of the greatest minds that you could possibly learn from. I mean, imagine being a young wrestler and coming up and having Paul Heyman mold you in a, in a, in a gimmick that he created, you know, as the Dudleys. And, you know, being able to work side by side with one of the greatest speakers um, in the history of the business. And a guy who has, you know, a, a great mind for psychology. So, you know, coming up under Paul was just awesome, and I learned so, so much. And then it's like, it's like going from Darth Vader to the Emperor. You go from Paul Heyman, you know, to Vince McMahon. And it's like now you see, you see things on an even bigger scale. And I've learned so many things from Vince. Um, so many individual lessons. I mean, I told you guys one before how he taught me to, you know, go out there and, you know, put things together for what the people really want to see. There's also other lessons that I learned from him, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. He taught me so much because I had a really good relationship with him just, you know, on a business and a personal level. So learning from those guys is incredible. Now Dixie. Dixie's been a phenomenal boss. Dixie runs a wrestling company from a more personal point of view. You know, I've learned things from her in the wrestling business that I would never learn have learned from Paul or Vince because those guys are such diehard pro wrestling guys, cutthroat guys. Dixie takes a different approach to things. So in one way, shape, or form, I have learned from all of them. I don't have anything negative to say about any of them because in their own way, shape, or form, they've all been great to work for. No, definitely. And, um, of course, you and Devon had so much success as a tag team. What do you make of the current state of the tag team divisions in both uh, WWE and TNA? There is no state of a tag team division anywhere. Tag team wrestling, unfortunately, is almost extinct. Um, I'm, I'm happy for guys like, like Bad Influence, like Daniels and Kazarian. And, you know, Rude and Aries were together for a while. And, you know, and Chavo and, uh, and Hernandez. Um, but it's, it just doesn't feel the same. I mean, as great as Frankie and Chris Daniels are together, I, I think they're, you know, uh, I, I don't think you can build an entire tag team division around that because there's just such a lack of other teams. Um, unfortunately, tag team wrestling, like I said, it's almost extinct. Um, I wish I could tell you that there was, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel for tag, for tag team wrestling in, in, in any division. But until WWE or TNA really puts the focus on trying to rebuild it, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. I am proud of the, you know, my, obviously my tag team run in, in ECW, the great tag team run in WWE and being the most successful team that ever existed over there. And then coming to TNA and having a phenomenal, you know, tag team career and getting, you know, to, you know, work with and help, you know, uh, develop teams like the Motor City Machine Guns and Beer Money and America's Most Wanted and any of the other great teams that, you know, uh, we worked with in TNA. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, buddy, and best of luck for Sunday. Thank you. Your next question comes from the mind of Chris Shore with ProWrestling.net. Hi, Bully. Thanks for taking the time today. Uh, someone alluded to your, your babyface run uh, earlier, and I was just curious. You, you, you've had a lot of great success over the years as a heel, and, and now having, you know, and you've played baby face characters before, but, you know, most recently you had this one. Do you think that you could have this same level of success as a baby face character should whenever this heel run as, as it currently is going kind of comes to an end? Could you see yourself changing over and having the same amount of success uh, with that side type of character? It's actually a very good question um, and something that I've actually thought about. Because I've taken the people on such a roller coaster ride over the past year to year and a half, I'm not exactly sure I could get the full emotional investment that would be needed to be a top tier baby face again. Can it be done? Yes. Will it take a lot of time and a lot of investment? Absolutely. Um, and you know what? Being light sucks. Being hated is so much better. So, you know, 
I, I tweeted it out the other day. If if you like me, that's good. If you respect me, that's better. But if you hate me, that's best. So, how's that? that sounds great. And and as kind of a follow up to the idea of when this run ends. So many times when we see these these major factions pop up, like Aces and Eights, where they're they're kind of all consuming of the show, we see them kind of of, of come to a, a, a terrible end in the sense of the, the stories tend to fall apart. There doesn't seem to be a conclusion. Uh, you know, sometimes it just you know gets kind of shatters all the way through the card. Is there any concern that happening with Aces and Eights? Is there a, is there a plan for how this ultimately plays out, or, um, or is it still just a work in progress? I think everything is still a work in progress, and I think as long as I continue with the Aces and Eights to generate the amount of disdain in people that we can do, the sky is the limit. Because I'll I'll even throw this I'll throw this back on you right now, and you answer my and you answer my question because I'm interested okay. to hear your answer. Tell me right now in in pro wrestling. Who generates the heat that I or we do? Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't believe there is anybody. Generates real hatred, real heat, real disdain—the kind of disdain that makes people want to throw bricks through your window. Who does it? I, I, I have to say, I believe it's you guys. Specifically, there you, you go. So the on the air, so. Gotcha. And 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 that's what's going to keep it alive for a long time because we bring to the table something that is you know you don't get a lot of organic response in the wrestling world anymore it's a lot of canned response okay i should boo him and i should cheer him that's not what you get with me and that's not what you get with us and i can't speak for all of the other guys but i can definitely speak for me and i know i can speak for Devon. You will never get that with us. If you hate us, you will hate us with every last breath in your body. And if you love us, you're going to love us till the end. Thank you for your time, Bullet. Good luck this weekend. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Pilkington. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Hi, Bullet. It's a brilliant to speak to you. Thanks. Um, so I want to start with something you've kind of touched on a little bit earlier, um, which is to say that you know you've been very successful in in every promotion you've wrestled for over the years. Uh, but what do you think is the key to that longevity in the industry and your ability to stay re- relevant for so long? Key to my success and my and my longevity and Devon's longevity is one word: passion. We are in the business that we wanted to be in. We came up the old school way. We paid our dues. We busted our asses. We, we, we got it. We've been up and down the roads. We've been all over the world. We've done it all, and it's still fun, and we still make a boatload of money doing it, and we still love the business. All those things keep our passion burning, and that's it. It's the passion for the industry. Not many people get to say, you know, that they wake up every day and they're doing exactly what they wanted to do with their life. I do. Devon does. You know, that's what keeps us going. Being able to help train some of the future stars of tomorrow in our wrestling school. Being able to help some of the younger guys in TNA reach their dreams and hopefully so they can make a lot of money and they can become future champions. All of that stuff, but I can say that we're the la- we're, we're we're the last of the Mohicans. We're the last of a dying breed because guys like us who have so much passion for this industry, you don't find a lot of them, uh, you know, anymore. Fantastic. And if I can just ask a quick follow-up from that, uh, you mentioned there the uh, the Team 3D Academy again. Um, what is the relationship currently uh, with TNA and the, the Academy? And uh, is there anybody currently there that you would like to see step up or perhaps even join you in Aces and Eights? Um, we, the Academy and TNA has done some crossover business before, um, we, but we are not affiliated with anybody. We're a standalone wrestling school. We don't work directly with any one particular wrestling company because that's not why we opened up a school. We opened up a school to help guys get started from day one. 
We don't promise them anything. We don't tell them we're going to get them jobs in WWE or TNA or Ring of Honor or Japan or any place. What we do tell them is when you leave our school, you're going to give you, you're going to have just enough info underneath, you know, in your, uh, under your belt to go out there and give yourself the best opportunity to succeed in the world of pro wrestling. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gans. It's a real pleasure to be here. And, and, just, and just as a quick follow-up, Sam Shaw, who will be wrestling, you know, uh, at Slammiversary, you know, um, in a Bound for Glory qualifying match, Sam Shaw is a graduate of the Team 3D Academy. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Yep. Your next question comes from the line of Dean Olsen. Uh, hey, Billy Ray. It's Dean Olsen here from News Limited Australia. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, brother. Now, at Slammiversary, if you manage to defeat Sting, uh, he will never get a shot at the TNA World Heavyweight Championship again. I'd like to know how important this is for you and the Aces and Eights to keep Sting away from the title picture while you're on top. It's extremely important because, A, no matter what, Sting will always be a threat. Um, you know, I've heard, I've heard rumblings like, you know, oh, Sting doesn't deserve to be in this position or... Maybe Sting's a little bit too much of a veteran to be in that position. Do you know what I say to those people? I say go to hell because you've never laced up a pair of boots and you don't know what it's like. Sting can still go. I'm in the ring with him. I'm the one who trades punches with him. I'm the one who lays into him and he lays back into me. And the guy has it 1,000%. He's one of the toughest guys I've ever been in there with, okay? And when he comes out there, the people love him. So does he deserve to be standing across the ring from me wrestling for the world heavyweight title? Absolutely. And we're going to deliver at Slammiversary. Well, at least I know I'm going to deliver and kick in his ass. Okay? And um, as far as, I'm sorry, the follow-up to your question about Sting, about you know him not being able to wrestle for the title again, it's a very important step. Because from a personal point of view, I do want that notch in my belt. I do want to be able to put him up on my trophy wall and say, look, there's Sting. I'm Bully Ray. I'm the guy that made sure he could never wrestle for the world heavyweight title again. I want him to have to lace up his boots knowing that I'm the guy that ruined his world title aspirations for the rest of his life. Okay, thank you. And uh, for a quick follow-up, I'd like to know, will the Aces and Eights be uh, following you and having you at ringside during your match at Slammiversary? You never walk alone. <laughs> very well. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining me, and good luck at Slammiversary. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Jamie Kennedy. Hey there, Billy. Um, you mentioned earlier the, the Team 3D Pro Wrestling Academy, um, and obviously there are so many different styles around and, and so much knowledge for, for young wrestlers to soak in. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, is there one specific piece of advice you were given right back at the start of your career which still holds true today? Absolutely. Two words. It's very simple. And I still tell these words to any up-and-coming wrestler that comes up to me and says, hey, what advice do you have? What advice do you have? It's very, very simple. You ready? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Get over. Get over. What that means is I don't care what you do when you go out there. I don't care if you run around naked and do handstands. Make the people react. Make them cheer. Make them boo. Make them laugh. Make them cry. Get them to invest in you emotionally. Get the people to do something. Get over because then a company will want to use you. I don't care what moves you can do. I don't care what it is. Just go out there and get over. Because if you can get over, a company will be forced to use you. Fantastic. And as a follow-up to that, um, I wanted to ask your opinion on this. Um, since going live, TNA really seems to have this extra buzz, um, which many people previously felt was lacking a little bit. 
Um, just how much has going live and also taking Impact Wrestling out on the road meant to the guys in the locker room and the promotion overall? Well, th- th- there's no doubt about it that going live is the best step ever for TNA. You can, y- y- you always want that feeling of anything can happen. The wrestlers feel it. The fans feel it. Live has so much more energy. Imagine if you went to a rock and roll concert. Imagine if you were watching Kiss and you're ready to see Kiss, but you really were just watching them on the big screen as opposed to live. Kind of, you know, it's it's cool and all, but. That eh, kind of loses its energy and its flavor. So going live is, is the absolute best thing. And as far as being on the road, you have to. You have to grow. You have to move forward as a company. You can't stay in one spot. You can't stay in a sound studio that you've been in for eight years. You need, you need new blood, new life, new passionate fans, people going crazy, you know, and uh, going on the road. The the people in the arenas have been loud, they've been with it, they've been getting entertained, they're getting their money's worth, and I think all of the fans and wrestling columnists and journalists can see the difference. And just finally as well, um, a quick note on AJ Styles, um, who's been quite a polarizing figure since his return. It's a very interesting character, and it's you know, it's got that link, or many fans have linked him with the Aces and Eights. Um, having wrestled AJ numerous times, you know a lot about him. Um, what have you made of his new, his new character, and do you think he would be a good fit with the Aces and Eights? Well, I thought he would make a good fit for the Aces and Eights, but as of last week, it didn't exactly go uh, the way I had planned. Um, I think AJ uh, uh, is content on doing his own thing right now. Um, being a guy totally on his own. Um, not only did he kind of stab, you know, me and the Aces and Eights in the back, but stab Turd Angle in the back. I don't think anybody knows where AJ Styles' head is at right now. Maybe you should call him. Um, I couldn't answer that question. It's going to be interesting to see um, what path AJ chooses in the weeks to come. Okay, um, thanks for your time, Billy. Um, congratulations on all your success, and good luck for Sunday. No problem. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Kevin Schuren. Hi, Billy. This is Kevin from Moonsault.de from Germany. How are you? Oh, yeah. How you doing, bro? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm looking forward to Slammiversary, actually. Uh, I will be watching on Sport1.de because... Uh, Television won't have it anymore, so uh, uh, we have it on the internet. But we pay for it, so uh, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, my question okay. is: What is besides your match? What is uh, the match from the Slammiversary card that you are looking forward to? From a personal point of view, my brother Devon's match against Joe Park. From a pure morbid interest point of view. I want to see what goes down with AJ and Kurt, especially with everything that just happened in the past couple weeks. I really want to see where AJ's head is at. AJ and Kurt have always had fantastic matches, go at each other really hard toe-to-toe. AJ's in a different mindset right now. I'm really interested to go with, you know, to see what goes on with, goes on in that match. And another one that has a little bit of personal interest for me is Sam Shaw versus uh, the Jay Bradley guy. Because uh, Sam Shaw is a graduate of Team 3D Academy, I'd like to see him win this match and uh, make it into the Bounce of Glory qualification. Cool. Um, you may be uh, following the Gut Check Challenge, and there's also a German wrestler on it. It's Bad Bones John Klinger. Uh, do you know him, and how, uh, how many chances do you give him to be a TNA wrestler soon? I don't know him, so I don't give him. I can't tell you what chance I give him. <laughs> okay. And, uh, well, last question. I, I heard you're a big soccer fan. And uh, um, the two German teams were in the Champions League finals last weekend. Uh, have yep. you followed the Champions League finals? And who were you rooting for? Yes. Yes, I watched the game. I really wasn't rooting for any any in particular team because uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of either one of those clubs. But uh, I was just hoping to see an exciting game, and, and it definitely was an exciting game. All right. Thank you for your time, and good luck on Sunday. Thank you. 
Your next question comes from the lines of Andrew Downs. Hi there, Billy. Um, I actually have quite an interesting question for you. Recently on our show, Ministry of Islam, we did a specific show dedicated to blood in professional wrestling and uh, whether or not it was necessary nowadays uh, concerning the health risks that are related to blood in professional wrestling. What I wanted to know, as someone who came from the land of extreme, what is your opinion on blood in professional wrestling and the possibility of blood-borne illnesses in professional wrestling due to, uh, obviously, blood? Well, all I know is guys have been bleeding for whatever reason in pro pro wrestling for a hundred years. Um, in ECW, I was in the ring with guys that bled every single night all over the place. Yep. Guys that might not have lead, led the cleanest of lifestyles. Do I think there's room for blood in pro wrestling? Well, yeah. Why shouldn't there be? Okay. Not having blood uh, in just, pro wrestling or every, you know, or things like that, it just goes with, to me, it's like the watering down of everything, like the watering down of society and everything so politically correct. I personally don't, you know, look at it like that, you know? Um, if you have a safe company and people are properly tested, um, then I don't see why guys can't get busted open and bleed out there and matches should continue. I have absolutely no problem with it. Perfect. Fantastic. I was just really interested to find uh, your opinion. Um, we're really just trying to get a broad view on the subject, and it's great to hear someone who's uh, obviously pro. I mean, a lot of people are very negative of it, so thank you for your time. Yep. Your next question comes from the lines of Donald Wood. Uh, hey, Bolio, this is Donald Wood from Bleacher Report and Ring Rust Radio. Uh, as great as your title win was and your title reign has been, uh, you get to enjoy it with Devon in the Aces and Eights. How, how special is that to, to work with someone? You, you, your whole life you have been with this guy. Now you get to enjoy uh, being at the top of the mountain. He has a title. You have a title. How great is that? Does that make it more special for you? i tell you what, it is kind of cool because let me ask you this. What other tag team in history – who has been as successful as me and Devon as a team, has enjoyed this side-by-side -side success as we are. Very few, if, if any. I, I don't know if you could – well, let's take TNA world title and TNA television title. Has any other tag team ever held the two highest-ranking titles in a promotion side-by-side? -side? No. So I guess we've done something special again. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sitting here. I'm not trying to be a douche and you know blow smoke, but it's fact. We went. We 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 became. The, we were the most successful tag team in wrestling history, and now we've accomplished this. I'm the world heavyweight champion. He's the TNA television champion. We head up the most successful faction in pro wrestling right now. Nobody has done it. We've <laughs> reinvented ourselves again, and we've put our our name on the tip of everybody's tongue. And that's Staying what kept your, us relevance for so long. Staying with your world title uh, with my follow-up here, uh, Hulk Hogan has come out and said he would like another shot at the title eventually. Uh, you and him have a beef, obviously, so how would you, would you like to fight Hulk Hogan eventually? Let's put it like this. After I defeat Sting at Slammiversary, I want Hulk Hogan in the ring. All right, good, good luck at Slammiversary. That's who I sir. want. I want Hulk Hogan in the ring. I want that match. I want to look across from him and know that his fate is going to be the same as Sting's. And let me tell you something. Hulk Hogan versus Bully Ray will get the whole wrestling world talking. For one reason or the other, people will be talking about it. And I don't care who sits back and goes, oh, Hulk Hogan, he's this or that. He doesn't belong there. At the end of the day, people will be interested. They'll be interested, and they'll want to see what happens. Thank you for your time. Yep. Your next question comes from the line of David Dunn. Hi, Bully. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about growing up and being a fan of tag wrestling in the 70s and things like that. Um, a little bit later on, did you used to watch any sting matches before you broke into the business? 
Oh, yeah. I, well, actually, one of my favorite standout matches of all time involved Sting in a tag team match. Uh, Halloween Havoc 89, Sting and Flair against Funk and Muda in the Thunderdome cage with special guest referee Bruno San Martino. Fantastic. How does it feel then to know that um, on pay-per-view you're going to be standing, you know, he's going to be on the opposite side of the ring to you and you're going to be wrestling? It, 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 no, it's cool. I, 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 won't, I won't downplay it at all, you know? I, listen, I, growing up, I wasn't a little stinger or a little Hulkamania or anything like that, but I was a fan of what these guys did, and Sting was always at the forefront of, you know, the NWA and the WCW. So, you know, whether I wanted to see Sting or didn't want to see Sting, I mean, he was always there as the top guy, you know? So to be able to stand across from him, knowing that he's always been a top guy, knowing that he has always... Uh, that he's been in one of my most memorable matches that I've ever seen, and knowing how hard he's going to come after me after I screwed him over, I mean, it's got you got everything there that you know that you need for a great main event. It's a very exciting scenario. Um, best of luck for the pay per view on Sunday, sir. Thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Josh Motherberry. Hi, buddy. Um... Yeah, just uh, your opponent uh, on Sunday, Sting, he was announced as the first uh, member of the TNA Hall of Fame at last year's uh, Slammiversary. Who do you think will be uh, the second member of the TNA Hall of Fame at this year's Slammiversary? Um, I, re I really don't know. Um, I, I have no idea. I'm sure, they'll, I'm sure they've sat around that big round table and, you know, discussed it. Let me ask you, who do you think it should be? I mean, I think it should be uh, Jeff Jarrett, to be honest, a uh, guy who started the company with his dad and um, not seen him for a while, but I think it would be great to induct Jeff. Yeah, that, that's, a, hey, that's, a, that's a great name. That would be a great induction. Sure, I agree with you. And uh, se second question, um, you, you had a magnificent tag team career. What were some of your favorite matches uh, from your and Devon's uh, tag team uh, career? I really don't have favorite matches. I, I really don't have favorite anything in my career because I don't put one anything in front of the other. Um, everything has been my favorite. I've enjoyed everything just as much as anything else I've ever done. But obviously there are moments in my career that stand out more than any. Um, the night that me and Devon hit our first 3D in the ECW arena. The night that we won our first ECW World Tag Team titles. Our last night in ECW in New York City where we both won and lost the titles in the same night. Obviously in WWE, the TLC matches. You know, WrestleMania 2000 was the first triangle ladder match. WrestleMania, um, uh, there was SummerSlam, which was the first official TLC there was WrestleMania 17, which most say is the greatest WrestleMania of all time, where TLC2 stole the show. Um, in TNA, all of the great matches that we've had against Beer Money and the Motor City Machine Guns. In Japan, winning the uh, 2005 All Japan uh, Tag Team League uh, Cup, going undefeated in the entire tournament. Um, winning the finals and defeating the great Muda and Akibono, all of those things stand out in my uh, memories of tag team wrestling. Definitely. And you're a big uh, football fan as well, or so soccer fan. Um, are there any wrestlers that you think will make good football players? Yes, Magnus. Magnus enjoys a bit of the footy. Uh, thank you so much. It's great speaking to you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, that will do it for today. Thanks for calling in and talking with our real champ, Bully Ray. Uh, again, if you need an MP3 of this call or any pictures, just let your PR representative know. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.